Yeah. Well, guys, we have just gone live. So welcome to everyone out there uh, watching. Welcome to another edition of Cap Social. We're doing a, a bit of a throwback Tuesday here, uh, joined by a couple of elite players from the, from the Cap's uh, early days, a couple of Hall of Famers, along with Craig Lachlan, uh, who you all know is the fine color analyst from NBC Sports Washington. But uh, shout out to, to Craig. But first, um, Mike Gartner joining us from Barrie, Ontario. Larry Murphy joining us from Birmingham, Michigan. And we appreciate greatly uh, both of you gentlemen spending some time with us today uh, on this uh, Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday evening uh, here on the East Coast. Uh, so thanks, guys. Um, let, let's dial it back to, to the, uh, the early 80s when, when both of you guys landed here uh, first. Uh, in Washington, Mike uh, coming here from after playing a year in the WH day, and uh, Larry a couple of years later uh, in an early season trade with the Kings, um, with the benefit of, of of all the hindsight and all the, the miles uh, you guys have logged uh, in the years since then. Uh, what's it been like for you to watch this um, this area grow as a hockey market from what it was when you both arrived? Uh, to what it is now and culminating with the, the, the Stanley Cup championship a couple of years ago? Well, I, I remember when I came in 1979, um, the Caps were, were still a very young franchise, have never made the playoffs at that time. And, and they were struggling, struggling as a franchise, struggling to find, uh, find their way. Um, I can remember back, and Murph, I don't know if you were there at that time, we had the Save the Caps campaign. Uh, so we had a we had to go to some council meetings in uh, in Prince George's County when they had the Cap Center in Landover, and the team was not guaranteed to actually uh, to actually play the following season. And I can remember uh, going attending these council meetings with a couple of other players, with Abe Poland, and and looking for help from the community, looking for help from the local government uh, for funding and. You know, so it was a touch and go thing at that time, uh, as well as the team that we had. You know, we didn't have a great team at that time, but we were starting to build, and we went through a lot of uh, a lot of growing pains. And then we started to acquire some players, started to draft really well. Um, I can remember when Murph came over from LA, and and all of a sudden we started to become a really good hockey team. And and now looking back on, as you said, we're we're in throwback, uh, a throwback type of. Although we've thrown it back a long ways. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, when we're looking at it and all the success that they've had over the last number of years, not to mention capping it off with a Stanley Cup a couple of years ago, um, they've come a long ways. Yeah, I got, uh, I got here, uh, the campaign was uh, no longer uh, active to save the caps. I think that the, the uh, team was much more stable. I got there the, the, uh, the post uh, Craig Lachlan arrival oh, oh, no, yeah. no 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 you always told me you saved the team you saved the team but well, now no, i'm starting to put the pieces together locker i'm figuring out i got here up to you know the big trade with the canadians and bringing you in so that's you know things took off from that moment so i, I missed out on all those uh, council meetings uh, the franchise was uh much more stable i wouldn't say that it was uh uh super strong but I, I think it was it was quite vibrant because I, uh, the team was really coming on of course uh, I imagine guards those first couple of years uh, you know the end of the 70s early 80s things were a little rough but boy uh, when I got there the team was right in the thick of things in the for the playoff race yeah where'd exactly. you guys live Everybody... when you were here what's that where'd you guys live when you were here I, I was in uh, Alexandria. I was on the on the uh, Virginia side because we were we were practicing at uh, Mount Vernon at the time. So it was uh, uh, the only time I had to deal with the bridge, the Wilson Bridge, was uh, for the for the games. But uh, we spent a, a lot of time at, in Virginia, so that's where I stayed. Uh, Garts, I think you were on the other side, right, Maryland wise. I was actually. I was out in Davidsonville, Maryland. I lived with Ryan Walter for uh, for a couple of years, and he lived out in Davidsonville, and that's where we ended up uh, building a house out in Davidsonville. Which locker? I think you're still around that area, aren't you? Yep, just Croft and Gambrel's, just about a stone's throw away, Gart. Same. Yeah. That's now I can remember back, Murph. Like everybody remembers and thinks that it was it was Rod Langway or Dougie Jarvis or <laughs> exactly. Ryan Englund that made that trade, but we know it was Craig Lachlan. Like can I turn this off like, now, fellas. Enough already, you guys. I was just I remember, telling everybody right. about how, what great teammates you were. 
<laughs> Garts, I remember the first time coming to the dressing room and uh, and uh, seeing, you know, you see all the sticks of the guys on the wall there. I remember seeing Locker Stick that, uh, I don't know what that was, a pitching wedge or, or not. I don't know. He was, Boy, he, I mean, a, a whole different approach to the game. So when you, had, when you looked at Locker Stick and you kind of thought, you saw that little wedge, as you said, and you wondered, like, how does anybody even keep it within the confines of the arena with that shot? You know, how was he able to dangle, dangle like he did point. out there? Try to that, make it that, easy. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, Get Mark, us back you back on the rails, Vogues. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do about that. But Larry, when you when you got here, you had actually played in the playoffs, um, and, and you obviously went on to win four Stanley Cups. You're the only guy in the history of the NHL to be part of two back-to-back -back championships with two separate teams, which is a heck of an accomplishment. But I, I want to dial it back to to your LA days because I think in your second year with in, in the playoffs. Uh, with the Kings, you guys ousted the the Oilers in the first round. That was that was before they they had won their cups, but they still had Gretzky, they still had Messier, they still had Curry, they still had all those guys. But you also played in that Miracle on Manchester game. You played obviously a couple, probably a couple of hundred playoff games. Do you ever play in a wilder game than than that one? And what do you remember about that that game? You guys were were down five nothing at the beginning of the third period, came back to win six five in overtime. Well, the, uh, the one thing was the uh, Jerry Buss owned the team um, at the time. And uh, he actually, after the second period, he left and uh, headed to Palm Springs. <laughs> so he, you know, so that's kind of basically, uh, you know, this, there was a, there were a few people left the building. But it was, yeah, it was a case of, uh, we're, we're up against the Oilers, uh, as, as you, you touched on, Mike, a real t uh, a talented group of guys. And they were extremely talented at the time. I just, they hadn't really reached the level of maturity, you know, that, that they needed to in order to, uh, to get over the top. But yeah, it was a team. They, um, they, they basically came into the third period and they, they figured it was all over and uh, they played accordingly. And then you, we score a couple of goals and all of a sudden uh, things get a little tighter and it turns out to be a uh, overtime victory. So as they call it, the uh, miracle on, on Manchester, it was, uh, it was a big moment for the Kings for uh, my boy. They hung on that for many years until they won the cup. Uh, I just, I guess just a few, few years ago for the mm -hmm. first time in the franchise, but that was definitely a big moment. And that was, I mean, I, you, I, you gotta be honest, you go out in the third period down by five, you really don't think yeah. you have uh, that much of a chance, but boy, you score early and then things snowballed. And, and uh, it was, it was, it was a highlight, definitely a highlight in my career. Darrell Evans always reminds me that Mark. Oh yeah, well, hey, you talk about you know milk and a play. I mean, right? <laughs> he, oh man, he's he lives that. Uh, he's still today. He's still uh, hanging on that one. Good for him. I mean, now he's yeah. been a radio analyst for the Kings now for how many yeah. years? Boy, he, yeah, big play paid off for him. <laughs> Most definitely. And and before that, you guys were both in the Ontario League, though. I don't. We were talking about this before. I'm not sure that you guys overlap because Mike left to go to the. Uh, the WHA, but um, what, what was it like to, because the other thing that's, that's kind of interesting was Mike was a fourth overall pick in 1979, one of the greatest drafts ever. And a year later, Larry was also the, the fourth overall pick. And you guys both came out of that Ontario league. What was that league like then? And how did it prepare you? And do you think that if you guys were coming up today, because, you know, I've talked with you guys before, you're both pretty intelligent, erudite guys. Do you think the college route would have been something you would have, gone maybe in, you know following the footsteps of a guy like Craig Lachlan who uh, did the uh, U.S. collegiate route that, that was that was not one that was taken by a lot of people in those days but if you were 18 17 coming up now do you think that's something you would have looked at a little harder now well definitely different times right Murph I mean Larry's only a, a, a year behind me um, in the as far as playing, I played in Niagara Falls. We had a, we had a bad, bad teams for a couple of years in a row and Peter Roll had great teams. And, um, and it was, it was obviously a real stepping stone playing in the OHL at that time, college hockey was, was good, but it was not a guaranteed route to get to the NHL where you could say now that if you're a good, good enough hockey player, it doesn't matter where you play. And um, certainly playing in college hockey gives you all the advantages of, uh, more development, uh, an education while you're playing at the same time, 
Um, my son played college hockey. My daughter played college hockey. And so, you know, I went through the OHL and yet my kids played college hockey and, and went that route. And it's really worked out well for them from the standpoint they've got a great education uh, from it. Um, so back then, I remember I still have letters that I have from, I had one from Princeton and I had one from uh, University of Michigan. Um, and uh, with Red Berenson had just started there and, and actually have a, uh, want, you know, interested in having me come there. But for me at that time, it just wasn't, it wasn't an option. Um, and so it, it worked out okay, but yet I look at the college game now and I'm a, I'm a big proponent of college hockey. Yeah, I feel the same way as Gartz uh, does it. At that time, it wasn't really the, the route to go if you're if you're if you had your sights set on the National Hockey League. Yeah, there was guys that were able to obviously pull it off, and uh, you know, Locker being one of them. But it was a uh, it was the number is a lot smaller than what than it is today. So I, same thing as you, Garts. I mean, I had a couple of letters, I had a couple of teams uh, uh, talk to me. I mean, um, I was only I think it was only in the tenth grade. So, but they real they had to make you you couldn't go play in the OHL. If, as soon as you played in the OHL, you were ineligible to play in U.S. colleges. So they would they would come at you a couple of years earlier than that, trying to get you to take a little different route and then be available for uh, for your first year of college. So, but yeah, I I, I mean, I, it was it was flattering, but it was uh, it, I never gave it a second thought, to be perfectly honest. And today, I definitely play. You get that opportunity. I, I tell you, it'd be tough to turn down that college route now because they, you know they're producing. As, as Gart says, you get great education, plus they are now producing great NHL players. Mike, how did it come about that you went from Niagara Falls to Cincinnati and, and went into the World Hockey Association? Uh, I know the draft, the year, um, you, you were eligible a little. Uh, there, were, there was something with the, uh, the draft eligible age that changed during that period of time, uh, w which had an effect on a bunch of guys leaving uh, junior hockey to go play uh, in the World Hockey Association that last season, 78-79 in the WHA. But who approached you from Cincinnati? Were there other teams that, that came at you and, and were trying to lure you uh, out of junior back then? Yeah, so what it was, for those uh, people listening that, that don't know, at that time, uh, back in 1978, it was a 20-year-old draft. So you had to be 20 years old to be drafted. And so there were some players that were, that were playing in the World Hockey Association at that time was about seven or eight teams and they were starting to, to uh, lure younger players to come and play that were under the age of 20. And so um, Wayne Gretzky went and signed with, uh, with the Indianapolis uh, Pacers at that time. A uh, few, few games into that season, the Pacers pulled and he went to the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, Mark Messi and I went to the Cincinnati Stingers, uh, Craig Hartsburg, Rick Five, Michelle Goulet, uh, Pat Reagan went to uh, Birmingham Bulls. And so the WHA was starting to kind of get ahead of the development curve and they were starting to take all the top young players that were available in the draft. And it was one of the uh, reasons why the National Hockey League was, um, was looking to do a merger with the WHA. I think they were looking to merge uh, just simply to eliminate their competition for young talent. And so that happened in 1979. They absorbed four teams into the, uh, from the WHA into the National Hockey League. It became a 21-team league, and they went to an 18-year-old draft. And it was one of the reasons why 1979 was considered one of yeah. the best drafts. It was also a double cohort draft. And so you had a whole bunch of really good players that were available uh, in that draft from two different age categories. Yeah, Garts, that happened. Uh, I was drafted in 1980, and, and that process, they were stepping it down. They, did, they stepped down one year to 19, then they stepped it down to 18. So the year I was picked, it was also, 1980 was two draft years. And, uh, uh, well, the Caps picked there in Beach the same year. I, I was picked by L.A. I think I was, I was four to L.A., and I think Beachy was five to uh, the Caps. But he was a year older than I was. But it just, yeah, that was all of a sudden, there was a, those two years, a huge influx of uh, young guys coming into the National Hockey League. You see, Murph, I, I didn't know that the Caps passed on you. So they passed on you. So that's exactly <laughs> oh, no, what they did. No, to I, get I, you. I was four LA. Beachy was five Washington. Oh, so it was the other way around. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 
And then somebody <laughs> said at the draft that we're going to do whatever it takes to get Larry Murphy on our team. So, I mean, I, somebody told me that was said. But I, I, I hey, you guys had long and distinguished careers coming out of junior and, and playing in the National Hockey. You guys still have memories of your first NHL game? Well, I, I definitely do. Um, it, it was in Los Angeles, and uh, it's – it, it's a, it's something that sticks with me. It was kind of that, that moment where you said, oh, my gosh, uh, you know, I, I finally made it to the National Hockey League. It was a, a dream as a kid growing up in Canada. And, and, you know, playing out in the streets or the rink in the backyard, it was always uh, – you were always playing the seventh game of the Stanley Cup Finals. That was you – know, every, every game you ever played out, the, out in the outdoor rink was – that was always the premise as little kids. So, for me, I just – I remember a locker. It was just a case of uh, – uh, Who are that, you that, playing? That sense and of hey, I fi I finally made it. You know that was you know that was definitely a, a moment that I I I remember. I cherish. Who were you playing? We're playing the uh, Detroit Red Wings actually, and uh, wow, the uh, my first defense partner Dave Lewis, who uh, <laughs> um, you know he went on. He was at, when I was in Detroit. He was the assistant coach yeah. there, and it was yeah, it was at the uh, the the LA Forum. It was still the forum at the time. It wasn't. It was. It wasn't the Great Western Forum or the fabulous. It was a forum fabulous that. forum. <laughs> so we. Well, yeah, I don't was, know uh, anything about the forum club, do you? Oh, <laughs> 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 the odd. No, the let's the go on the uh, guys. Let's go on the guys. You know, just, just, you know, promoting the game. That was, you know, that's why I looked at it. after the game, heading up to that forum club. It was just, you know, to shake hands and. <laughs> Just tell the fans thank you. That was all there was, Locker. <laughs> Let me put a beer in my hand. It was a mistake. It was meant to be. <laughs> what about you, Gart? I, I remember playing uh, – it was either my first game or first, second or third game playing against the Montreal Canadiens, and it was at the Cap Centre, the old Cap Centre. And I remember uh, opening face-off. I'm on, on the right side, and I look right across the circle, and there's Guy Lafleur, and if, wow. for whatever reason that crossed my mind, it's like, what am I even doing out here? I'm on the same ice as Guy Lafleur, and uh, you know, you do, you get playing, and you realize, you know, you can play in the league, you can, and then you realize, okay, now it's going to be tough to stick around, and you try to do that. But I can, I can clearly remember my my first uh, game. I can remember the first experience playing against uh, the Montreal Canadiens and Guy Lafleur, the great Guy Lafleur. And um, those types of things stick in your mind where you, you realize that, uh, that, you know, that you're, you, you're finally in the National Hockey League. And even when I signed in the WHA, and I signed actually a five-year contract in the WHA, hoping that it was only going to be a one-year contract, mm -hmm. but it was a five-year contract, no, and hoping that I would eventually get to play in the NHL. And then, as Murph said, you know, when you finally get there, it's uh, – you kind of give yourself a pinch for the, uh, the the first year at least. Hey, Garts, I got a I just like the Montreal story. I got I got something uh, very similar, and I've never heard that story from. It surprises me. I I remember early in my first season, we we're in the Montreal Forum, and I was standing. It was at uh, I was starting the game, and I was standing on the blue line for the for the national anthems, and they had uh, Roger Doucette that used to belt it out. Yeah. And uh, I remember I was stood there, and there was a, a uh, Guy Lafleur was starting. I think Steve Shutt and, and uh, Larry Robinson, and I, I was shaking so bad during the national <laughs> national anthem that I, I honestly thought you got you might fall down here. You've got to you know you got to stand up. And so it was it was that was just a, a, an unbelievable moment for me seeing those guys over there just shaking like a leaf during the during the national anthem and just hoping that they'd get it over quick so I could move before I fell down. You just want the game to start, right? Yeah. It's like all this other stuff. It's like I am so nervous just watching all this stuff. Let's just start the game because we know how to play hockey, but all this other stuff is just way too weird. Yeah. Well, Mike, that, the World Hockey Association was a pretty rough and tumble league, uh, too, and, and they had a lot of characters. And I just wonder what it was like for – an 18 year old kid to, to step into that environment and how, I mean, I would think that the success that you had there, cause you had a good season there that probably gave you a lot of confidence going into the NHL. But what, what was that one season in Cincy like as far as integrating well, yourself with a bunch of older guys? Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a great stepping stone, but I mean, the WHA, we had heard all the stories. It was like the wild, wild West, right? I mean, teams were folding all the time. New teams were popping up. Guys weren't getting paid. There was all kinds of crazy things happening. So I can still remember going into Cincinnati. I start playing. My first 
shift is an exhibition game against Pittsburgh. And I'm lined up against Dave Schultz, and he's playing for the Pittsburgh Penguins. I'm thinking, man, here's Dave the Hammer Schultz that I'm playing against. And so you kind of get through that scenario. And then I heard stories about guys not getting paid. So when I got my first paycheck in Cincinnati, uh, they said sometimes guys would get – the first few guys that cast their checks would get paid, and the, and the last few guys wouldn't get paid. And so I remember getting out of my equipment so fast, jumping in the car, getting down to the bank, <laughs> and making sure that my, my check got cashed, which it did. And it got cashed for the rest of the year because uh, the DeWitt family was in, owned, the, uh, yeah. owned the Cincinnati Stingers at that time. And they were a great family, a great sports family, and continued in, in sports for many, many years. Um, and so we were fine. But just those types of stories were the ones that you kind of you know, you look back on and, and have a bit of a laugh over. The other thing was we played against New England, the New England Whalers that time. Gordie Howe was playing for the New England Whalers. Davey Keehan was playing for the New England Whalers. We played against them 22 times that year, 22 times. Between the few games we played in the preseason, between the games we played in the regular season, and then we played them in the playoffs 22 times because there were only seven teams in the league back then. So I had a little bit of a glimpse of what it would have been like playing in a six-team National Hockey League playing in a seven-team World Hockey Association. And that's crazy. Everything except the train travel, right? Um, train travel? Well, in the, in the, in the original. Eric Hirsch just missed that. He's just uh, – <laughs> Didn't get that. That's, um, when you guys uh, were here in the 80s, and, and you obviously went on to, to play in other places and, and had a lot of experience with – played I mean, between two of you guys played over 3,000 games in the league you're both in the top 30 all-time Larry you're third all-time among defense when you guys both had long and distinguished careers and played for a few different organizations but when you look back on it all was there anything that was singular about your experience here in Washington that that stood out as being different or unique from from the other places that that you eventually traveled on to well I would say uh just looking at it as a body it uh, is I just I'm so disappointed that we didn't have more success than than we did. Uh, absolutely, a absolutely. Team that just couldn't yeah. catch a break come playoff time, and I know thank you know thank goodness the franchise finally shook that you know by winning the cup. But I don't know about you uh, guys, but yeah, I mean I, I just I it, it's just when I think back, I go that's boy we we should have had more success with the type of team we had going in and and. Uh, and just, uh, you know, how hard, you know, how bad we wanted, how hard, you know, we had great regular seasons. It's just, we just fell short. And that, that's probably, we had, you know, exciting guys. And, the, and David Poyle brought this franchise a long way, but we just couldn't ever get, get over the hump. You know, and I, I follow up on that too, Murph, because like Locker, you and I have talked about this a couple of years ago when the Caps were making the run too. Like, yeah. when I look at our team that we had, and I honestly, Murph, I say I, you're here now, but I've said it to many people. I said, we had Larry Murphy, we had Rod Langway, we had Scott Stevens, and we had Kevin Hatcher, three Hall of Famers and a great, a great defenseman on our defense. Those, yeah. those were our top four defensemen. Yeah. Maybe tough to get another, a better top four anywhere, anytime. And, you know, we had goals, we had goals scoring, we had great. Uh, role players on our team. Our goaltending was good, and I'm I'm with you, Murph. It's something that I always kind of wonder. We just we couldn't catch a break. The, the playoff format was a tough playoff format back at yeah. that time. We we were finishing second, third overall, and we were end up playing against a team that finished fourth or fifth overall in the first round. It, it was it was tough. It was it was disappointing looking back on. It. Yeah, that that, I mean, that, that that was crazy. I remember the first round of the playoffs. We used to play four games in five nights. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah, brutal. Yeah, those best of five series didn't do anybody any favors, and like and like you say, the uh, the format was was different, and you know the, the the best team doesn't always. I don't think in a in a best of five situation uh, come to the four. Uh, anyway, um, when when uh, Murph, I, I I look at you as being part of the. Uh, the deal that brought Locker here because Brian Engblom was in that deal and then he was sent to Los Angeles, obviously, in the trade that brought you here. And back in those days, I felt like 
general managers were, were pretty trade happy early in the season. This is obviously before the salary cap and everything. And it seemed like if a team got off to a, a one and five or a two and two and seven start, um, they'd start looking to rearrange the deck chairs, whether, whether it needed to be done or not. And, and uh, a lot of times they'd call up another GM who was in the same boat and say, Hey, what, what can we do to sort of rearrange the furniture? You, the flip guys, you saw that going on until the early part of this century. And then salary cap kind of shut that down. But you were involved in that early season deal that I think the Caps were 0-6 or 0-7 that year when they made that that trade. And they had gone finally to the playoffs um, the year before. But you, you'd had three really good years in Los Angeles. Did you see that trade coming at all? Or what were yeah. your uh, experience with, with that deal? Yeah, well, uh, just, you know, I did see that trade coming. But the, the, just a funny thing about that trade, it was I got traded for uh, – uh, Brian Inglom and Ken Houston, and I don't know if the guys remember it. Ken Ken Houston went to L.A., and the first game he played for the Kings, he scored a hat trick. <laughs> and I, and I, I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> I remember the guys ribbing me in the dressing room saying, oh, boy, <laughs> no what a great trade that was. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was uh, – uh, my uh, story was I, I went to um, – I went to salary arbitration with the Kings. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it, was, uh, it wasn't as fair as it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it wasn't an either-or uh, proposition. And, what, and, and the arbitrators were handpicked by the National Hockey League. So I wasn't happy with the outcome of, uh, of the, the arbitration. I went into the general manager and I said, uh, yeah, this, this contract stinks. Uh, Sign me to a new one or trade me. <laughs> and okay. Three days later, I was in Washington. So, <laughs> and fellas, and folks, works. you you'll get a laugh out of this, folks, in particular because you know this. My first couple of games playing, and Murph is out there. I was like saying hello to him more than I did my center and my left wing. <laughs> <laughs> I I just look over to my shoulder. Hey, Murph, how you doing? Boom. Ultimate. <laughs> ultimate. Superior defense with this guy. Uh, well, yeah, there's there was no. Uh, I, I know. Who, I was your, who was your? Brian, uh, Brian Murray partner? already had a few gray hairs when I got there, but <laughs> who I, was your D partner? More to that. Who was your D partner, Murph? Ah, you know, I, uh, Rod Langway. He won. I think the first year I played with Langway, he won. He won the Norris Trophy. So, I, you know, I That's always, why take, I asked I always the remind him of that fact. Yeah, so. and I'll remind him again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I played with Rod. I mean, what a. I mean. It's talking about Rod Langway, and, and I say this in all seriousness. Seriousness, I, you, I don't know if you look back through the history of the game, if you're going to find a pure defensive defenseman that that was that dominating. I mean, you look at guys today. Anybody's got a con consideration now for the Norris Trophy needs that kind of has to have both elements in their game. But Rod was, this, you know, he was a defensive defenseman, and he was so good at it that he won the Norris Trophy a couple of times. So I mean, he's definitely in a, in a unique uh, category by himself a guy that's just played defense and won the Norris trophy by just how well he did that Mark, well, like i always tell him i said he really got better playing with you because he learned how to play two on ones <laughs> <laughs> exactly you know what just picking up on roddy too like the thing with rod like th there hasn't been another defensive defenseman put in the uh, in the hall of fame since Rod Langley. Yeah. And it's very difficult. Like I'm on the Hall of Fame selection committee and um, it's difficult to compare now. You know, we, we put a defensive forward in uh, this year who also happened to be a really, really good offensive uh, forward too in Guy Carbono. And there aren't a lot of defensive forwards that have gone in, but there, there are so few defensive defensemen that have gone into the Hall of Fame. And Rod Langley's that one. And as you said, Murphy did it a couple of times. And playing with somebody like he was like when Brian Leach, uh, you know, played as well with um, with Jeff Bukaboom Buk uh, in New York. I mean, it was a great combination because you had a good, solid stay at home defenseman. You had somebody that could take a few more chances. It was a great combination. But with Roddy, I mean, the other thing about Roddy, too, is um, there were very few like Rod, Rod liked to go out and have a few beers. We all kind of know that. But Roddy always came to practice, always came to the games, obviously, but always came to practice, and he was always the hardest working guy in practice, no matter what kind of condition he was in. And I always <laughs> appreciated that about Rod is 
is he was uh, he played hard, he worked hard, and uh, he always kind of led by example as far as his work ethic. Who were uh, who were the coaches that you would say over the course of your careers had the biggest impact on on you, um, your, your development, or, or you know just on a game to game basis? Because I know you guys between the two of you have played for a couple of the uh, couple of the greatest coaches uh, we've ever coached. Well, I, I you know for me. Uh, when you have success, obviously that coach kind of, you always feel, you know, view him much better. And, and sure. I'd say for me, Scott, uh, Scotty Bowman was, I played with him in Pittsburgh and played with him in, uh, played for him in Detroit. So I, I've had him probably more, I, well, I basically did have more than any other coach. I'd say, you know, he's the guy for me that jumps out just a, a, a you know, his success was no fluke. He, he was a very interesting, quirky type of guy, but there was nobody that, his greatest strength was he knew the opposition and he knew exactly what you need to implement in order to take advantage of their weaknesses or, and how, how they approach the game. He was just a tremendous coach and, 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 and like a lot, a lot of things in sports, it didn't come easy. I mean, he, he, there was nobody that watched more hockey than he did or worked harder at it. So for him, I'd say he, you know, he's a guy that jumped out. Uh, for me, I would say, um, uh, I only had, uh, the first time I won a, a cup in Pittsburgh was Bob Badger, Bob Johnson, who was a great man. Unfortunately, he came ill of cancer and he, 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 I only had him for one season, but that was another guy that stands out. And then of course I, you know, there's a bunch of minor league coaches or amateur coaches or kids. I think a guy, you know, guys that went out there and, and, and donated their time and effort that, uh, you know, so you're able to play these games. So I, I'd say there's a whole, you know, a whole slew of guys, but yeah, I'd have to put Scotty Bowman on the top, but just, for the fact that it had success with him. Yeah, and for me, it was Roger Nielsen. Like, Roger was uh, somebody that I had a little bit later in my career with the New York Rangers. And I always looked at Roger was such an innovative thinker of the game. And I found that, I, you know, I, I could play the game, and I showed up, and I worked hard and, and, uh, and played. But I found out that I, I learned so much about the game from Roger Nielsen and how the game – um, is is played from a technical standpoint and why you do things and the and playing the odds and and so I always I, I, pro, I appreciated Roger as a person he always allowed you to be a professional if if you weren't a professional if, if you were a guy that needed you know uh, a, a kick in the pants all the time Roger probably wasn't the kind of the right coach for you but if you were somebody that that wanted to just give us the information just give us all the information Give us a direction, let us play. Roger was the best coach that I, I have had uh, that had his teams prepared, that was innovative, and that taught me a lot about the game. Was he still – oh, had he got into the video by then, Mike? <laughs> yeah, he had got into the video by then. He was, he was leading the way. He was so, so many years ahead of his time with video. Um, and – you know, we used to talk about shooting lanes and angle of sticks and, uh, and, and things like that. He had pretty much invented the trap, which wasn't probably a real good thing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, he could break the game down uh, into bits and pieces that everybody could understand. He utilized his team extremely well. He used, utilized his top players, but he utilized his role players really well, too, um, in that everybody really felt like they were part of it, but uh, but the video was a big part of it and breaking the break, breaking the game down uh, in bits and pieces, especially on video, was was a big part of uh, Roger's approach to the game. And fellas, you guys are both Hall of Famers, and when you look at the way the game has changed, do you think you'd have even maybe more success? I think both of you would even now more so, even though you're Hall of Famers the way the game's played without the hook and the hold and all that, especially for you, guards, do you see that you would have had the same type of career with the way the game's played now compared to when you played? Yeah, I mean, a different game now too, right, Murph? I mean, it's, um, it's, it's a game that I would have loved to have played uh, this type of game yes. where, um, where you could play, where – I mean, skating was a big part of my game about not, not going through the neutral zone without getting hooked and grabbed and, and held. Like, it's, it's fun watching old games, right? Like, some they've play, been playing a lot of them lately, unfortunately. Um, but you see some of the old games, and they're quite entertaining. And the first thing that you realize is, wow, 
there's a <laughs> lot of hooking and holding going on. Out there. And, uh, and it's a good thing, but mostly it's not, it's not a good thing. It's the one thing I like about the game right now. I think that uh, there are a couple of things that I don't like about the game now. Um, and that is that, uh, that there just isn't as, as much contact in the regular season. In the playoffs, it's the best game because there's both contact and there's skill and the rules are called, you know, correctly and a fair number of things get, uh, you know, get not called, which is a good thing. And there's, there's playoff hockey is great right now. There's a couple of stinkers go on during the course of the season, but that's going to happen at any time and in any era. But uh, I would like to try to have played in the, uh, in the era of now. I know it's it's uh, you look at the way you used to uh, the equipment you used to uh, prepare for yourselves when you played it was all about guys because you, you, you're going to go out there and it's got the puck on your stick. I mean that, that's what was taught to the guys. You don't you, you put your stick on the guy constantly. You don't let anybody go by you without putting a stick on it. The guy's got the puck. I mean you, you do what you can to get it away from him. It includes hooking and holding. So I remember it used to put little you know, I had little plastic pieces above the gloves and I had a little, <laughs> little piece on the elbow pad. And I know guys would, some guys would put bat pads down their back because they'd get cross-checked in front of the net. You'd have, you'd do all these, these little things to protect yourself that you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to do in, in today's game. But it was, uh, it's, it's interesting guards. Like, you, you know, you score what, 700 goals. And I, you think, well, if you put Mike Gardner in the game today, you know, how many goals would he have scored in today's game? But what was interesting about the type of player that you were was you fed off that. I mean, there's nothing that drove you crazier. If somebody grabbed your stick, you like you in front of the net. I mean, the worst <laughs> thing you do out there is don't grab Mike Gardner's stick or he'll break it over your head. I mean, so, I mean, you fed into that type of hockey too. So you, you weren't just the guy that just skated 100 miles an hour. No, no, it's, it's true, but, uh, but you're right. You know, you talk about equipment. When I first came, came in, all I had was I had two, my, I took my shoulder pads, I cut the padding off them, I took the caps, and I sewed the caps onto my suspenders. That's what I wore. I wore two caps. Roddy did the same thing. I yeah. wore two caps on top of my shoulders. And then I was real, realized that I'm getting killed out here. So then you start to put the chop guards on. And then I start to put a little more padding on. Then I put the full, you know, the full shoulder pads on. And then I get them cross-checked in front of the net. So then I got a back pad. I, by the time I was done, I had full body armor. There wasn't a square inch that was open <laughs> anywhere on your body because, you, you know, you're getting abused by that at that time. So it is kind of funny that you talk about equipment and how, uh, how equipment has changed. What were the off-seasons like for you guys? Did you, did you have jobs? Uh, back in Ontario uh, when you when you went home for the summer well I, I did I didn't have a job it was um, I mean training it, you took some time off you, there was there were still expectations nothing like today in terms of of conditioning but you're expected to uh, show up at camp in shape but yeah you go home take a few weeks off and then you kind of get you get back at it I, I, I've never uh, never worked you in say a few weeks more Murph, what? Did you say a few weeks off? <laughs> Is that all? A few well, weeks? A few, six, seven, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all depends on how for how far you went in the playoffs, right, Murph? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you had you had uh you could finally go in the playoffs, the less time you had to get out of shape before the next training camp. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was uh um the summer. Hey, it was just a ca uh, case of getting away from it, I guess, and then for, and then you, at some point you start ramping it up for the next season. And uh, I didn't, I don't know about you, guards. Did you work at all in the summer? No, I never worked, but um, I worked out. I worked out quite a bit. We used to go up to our cottage all the time, and and I had a, a gym in the basement, and and uh, you know I would go out. I'd spend the first three hours of every day, you know, working out in some capacity, whether it be going out and biking. I used to actually. Parents will think this is kind of crazy, but we used to take our son, who was about uh, three years old, and put him on one of those bikes, uh, bike seats, you know, in the back of my uh, my road bike, and I'd be I I use him for training. I'd use him for a little ballast on the back of the bike, and <laughs> and some of the hills that I went down, I realized like I'm going like 60 miles an hour. I'm going down 60 miles an hour down the hill, and I got my three year old on the back, you know, and uh, didn't do that. My wife got a little mad at me uh, 
after a while doing that. But I did that, did some rollerblading uh, on the roads. I'd go find a very, you know, newly paved uh, strip of country road somewhere and do some rollerblading with my stick and my gloves in the middle of a, a summer morning. And um, yeah, just tried to stay in shape and get ready. And it's funny though, you know, you go, th go through the summer, you're working out pretty hard. As soon as August 1st kind of rolls around, it's like, you know, I'm just not relaxed anymore. Like, you know, it's just around the corner and you're really ramping up and it just becomes a lot less relaxing because you know you're ready to play hockey again. Whereas this year, the guys might be ramping up August 1st to actually play some games. Who knows? And Garts, I always wanted to ask you this, and I was upset that I never did when I was your teammate. How did you become such an elite skater? Well, you know what? Uh, locker, I, I was always a good skater, even as a kid. So there was a little bit of a natural ability there and a little technique. I, I used to, my dad used to send me to, instead of sending me to hockey school, he used to send me to power skating. I couldn't stand it. Like all we did was just skate all the time and the guys would kind of, they'd be yelling at you and tell you to bend your knees and everything else. And I did that for about three years in a row when I was a younger kid. And it probably helped me a lot because I became a really a really good skater at that time. And um, I'm I guessing Walker didn't do that. Walker <laughs> no, didn't do sir, that, maybe. I had never heard of power skating. <laughs> you know, Walker, we could have stayed out after practice, you know, and done a little bit of extra skating. No, I was Any working on my work? shot, guards. Come on. <laughs> you had a good shot, Locker. You had a good shot. Now you know, he drew I was looking for a stool at the ground round so right after practice. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I talked about the speed. Uh, Garth, you had a custom jersey though, right? Well, I don't know about a custom jersey. I used to take a jersey. A little I used shorter. To, I used to shorten it up. And, yes. Um, yeah, Fans so know I did. that, Garth. That's cool. And I had a shorter jersey, and I used to get it a, a size or two bigger than, than it did because I wanted it kind of re really kind of uh, loose. Because the way I looked at it is that I used to get hooked a lot, as we talked about. And um, if, if, I could, if I could get a defenseman hooking me and seeing my jersey kind of swinging in the wind a little bit with the hook, I felt like I could draw more penalties that way. So I kind of tried to use it to my advantage a little bit. Wow. I mean, as, as you mentioned, Locker, earlier, these two guys are both Hall of Famers. And yep. in, in March of 1989, they were traded for another Hall of Famer, uh, Dino Cicerelli, and that was the the first trade ever for Mike, obviously second time around for Larry, but it's, it's one of only, you know, the league's been around for over a hundred years and there's been a zillion trades, but there's only been two that have involved three hall of famers. And I, I don't know, it, it may never, may never happen again, but that was one of them. I'm just wondering what you guys remember about that day. I guess you guys were in Montreal and practicing. Did you see it coming? Did you have an inkling and what were your thoughts when you found out and how did you find out? Well, I, uh, I knew it was coming. Um, we were in Montreal. It was, a, it was That was the trade deadline day. And and we had scheduled practice for 3 o'clock that afternoon at the Forum, which was the uh, the deadline for uh, uh, for the de for the trade deadline. So I'm, I'm in the dressing room beforehand. I, I, I'm quite sure I'm getting traded, but I haven't got the word yet. So it's, it's getting like 10 to 3, and I'm going – uh, and, and I realized too that sometimes a trade happens at close to three o'clock and it doesn't get announced till 10 minutes after whatever. I know that's, I knew that was a possibility, but I, I've still got to go out on the ice. So I race and I get my equipment on right at, uh, and I can, I step on the ice at three o'clock and I, I, I go to do a lap and I do half a lap. I get down behind the net and I start coming back up and I, I look over to the bench and I see uh, Brian Murray, our coach. Give me the big, give me this one. <laughs> so I, I knew, I knew what uh, what that was. So I turn around, go back, uh, you know, back to the dressing room. He tells me I've been traded. I got to take all my stuff off. So that was probably the quickest practice of my career, lasted about <laughs> four seconds. So I, I don't know when. when did, where, where were you, guards, when that happened? I was with you, Murph. I was on the ice a little bit earlier, so I got about two laps in you, to your half lap. <laughs> And I remember going out, and as Brian Murray's calling you in from the bench, Terry Murray comes up to me and taps me in the pad and says, yeah, uh, Brian wants to see you in the dressing room. And, I, and unlike you, I hadn't heard a word, right? I mean, I did not know anything. I mean, it came out of the left field, and I, I'm thinking, I wonder what he wants to see me for. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we got in the dressing room, and I remember we were told, and start packing up your stuff. It was the weirdest feeling, I mean. 
it, yeah, yeah, and then off, off to uh, we did go. We went back to Wash first before I think before we went to Minnesota. But it, if I remember right, we just we went to the hotel, got our stuff, off to the right airport. to Minnesota. I know. I think we were playing like two two nights later. I think yeah, I do remember going into Minnesota. Yeah. yeah, I remember going into Minnesota, and we got we got to uh, we had to go to one of their practice. Well, one of their one of our practices with the North Stars. We got on the ice. And um, for whatever reason, I guess it was just the adrenaline and stuff like that. We're on the ice and Pierre Paget is going around screaming at us. And um, <laughs> it was like a two and a half hour practice. It's like a two and a half hour practice. I'm exhausted after an hour. It's like, I, I can't, this is the longest practice of my life. He, uh, Pierre Paget was something, eh, Garth? He, oh, man. We, we talked before the games, he gets so upset at the corners of his mouth would foam up. <laughs> he would he'd get so upset in between periods sometimes he'd actually be he'd actually be spitting and yeah. you know, it got to the it got to the point his eyes kind of started bulging out and he got so so upset with us and he's screaming and Murph he's straying words together that I I don't think you could ever string together like it's like all those words don't go together but they did for Pierre and you know he probably he probably laughs about it now too but like there was a time where we'd come in and, and we'd be kind of, we'd be looking forward to it. It's like, this is going to be a show or something. We've never seen a show like this before. <laughs> remember the, remember uh, Billy Siren, uh, the defenseman, the Spanish yep. defenseman? He used to do his Billy Siren imitations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. It was entertaining, that's for sure. I mean, the guy that, there was no, there wasn't anybody that wanted to win more than he did but but, but that's he for just, sure he couldn't keep it under wraps he just no couldn't keep and we and we had a pre, we had a good pretty good team but we had a pretty tough team too right and oh yeah we remember, got into so many Gurla spots and mccray in the in the uh in the bathroom before the games oh man with the vaseline on <laughs> you remember the brawl that we had in chicago oh, the chicago yeah. stadium in warm-up warm we had 20 we had 25 guys on the ice in warm-up each each team and all of a sudden, about three quarters of the way through warm up, the puck started kind of flying, right? And the next thing you know, the gloves are off. Shane Churla and Wayne Van Dorp are fighting. And then Mark Tenorti gets into it. And I don't know about you, Murph. I'm looking for where's Denny Savard? I'm looking for Denny. I want to pair off with Denny Savard. <laughs> and the police oh, came up like, it's a brawl. It's a melee. It's, it, it's like a brawl going on in warm up. There's no referees. Referees come up. One guy's got one skate on. They've just got the bottoms. They don't have their jerseys on. Then the police come out on the ice. And then Mike Keenan comes out and Pierre Paget. And they break everything up. And everybody goes back to their dress rooms. And I remember thinking, well, oh, this is going to be quite a game. And I don't think there was a hit thrown in the entire yeah, game. Yeah, there wasn't. <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> you guys wore yourselves out before the game, eh? Oh, oh man. man. This is one of the most one of the fascinating things I think about the business is that when you're traded, especially at the deadline, you're expected to, to get there, you know, pronto post haste uh, team just gave up assets to get you. They more, more often than there are a lot, lot of situations. They got you for a, for a playoff run and they need points and they need to win games right away. And uh, you know, most, most of us in, in regular life, us civilians, you, you change jobs, you do it of your own volition. You, you're 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 given some time to hit the ground running. You guys basically you got to pack up your whole life, your family. You're you're going someplace new. You got to integrate yourself. You got to find your way to the rink, to the airport, all these things. What was that like? Because um, I know you were both traded in season and both traded in the summer as well. But what was, what are the difference? The real differences between those two scenarios? Well, well I'd I'll, say, I'll uh, step in. Go ahead, Murph. Oh, sorry, Garth. Yeah, I, I just, just kind of like the, the, just what it's like. I was in when I was in Minnesota. I went from Minnesota to uh, Pittsburgh, and uh, I got a call at eleven o'clock, and I had to catch a one thirty flight Oof. to Pittsburgh to play that night. And I packed up uh, two bag, two suitcases, walked out the door, and to this day. I own, and I own the house to this day. I've never seen that house again from that from that morning when I got the call that I was traded. Gone. Never. I've never seen it since. I mean, went to Pittsburgh, and of course everything was moved out. 
uh, and followed me later, but I never, I mean, that's just, that's the way it is in pro sports, boy, you get the call and you're on your way and, and your life changes like that. Yeah. And I had a family at the time uh, in all the, all the trades, uh, I was married. We had a couple of kids and it was always tough on my wife and, and kids because you're right, I'd be gone and they'd be, they'd be back, especially my wife, just kind of taking care of everything. Um, when I got traded from, uh, from the Rangers to the Leafs, uh, we were in actually out in Calgary when I found out about it. And uh, I didn't even have an opportunity to phone my wife. She, she was back in New York and they happened to be at a hockey rink uh, for one of my kids was having a game. And she found out from somebody that had heard it on the radio that I had been traded. That's how they found out that I had been traded to, to wow. Toronto from New York. And then the other time was in a summer, and I, I got to got to tell you this story. It's a funny story. It's not. It's funny now. It wasn't so funny then. But in the summer, I, I got traded. Um, so we're actually out in uh, in June, in uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. We rented a motorhome. Uh, my wife and uh, myself and our two kids. So we rent a motorhome in Phoenix, and we we do like a, a tour. So we go down, we we go up the coast, we go across to the coast, we go up the coast, uh, the California coast. We come across the Sierra Nevadas, and we we come back down, and we're stopping in the Grand Canyon, and uh, we want to take a helicopter ride. So we're in the hangar of uh, of this helicopter uh, place to take one of those helicopter rides in the Grand Canyon, and so we're sitting in the waiting room, and the two kids are just kind of doing what they're doing, and. And uh, my wife's sitting there and I said, well, you know, I'm looking for a paper. It's, it's draft. The, the, the NHL draft was happening. I want to see, you know, who drafted, if anything happened. And so I went outside to go into the, one of those boxes to see if I could pick up a newspaper. Couldn't find the newspaper. And so I come back in the waiting room. There's a guy sitting right there. And he's got, a, he's got the Arizona Republic open. He's got the sports section open. And so he's reading the sports section. And I look over and on the front of the sports section, it's coyotes get Gartner. And so I went, what the heck? And so I grabbed the, my wife's looking at it the same time. She grabs the paper from the guy says, can I have the paper? So she reads and she says, we've been traded to Phoenix. And so that's how I found out that I've been traded to Phoenix was in the helicopter hangar waiting room to go for a helicopter ride over the Grand Canyon, which happened to be in Arizona. So uh, it was kind of bizarre. Yeah. I have a similar, uh, not as, not as crazy as that one, but it was in the summer and I, and I, uh, the NHL draft was on. And this is when I went from Pittsburgh to Toronto and I, I uh, sat down, turned it on, you know, I'm you know, curious to see who's going to get picked. And the next thing I know, the announcer comes on and, and says, Hey, uh, you know, saying that I, Larry Murphy has been traded to Toronto. So that's, that's how I found. I watched TV and then found <laughs> out that uh, I was traded. So if you guys haven't figured it out already, so Murph and I put, were teammates in Washington for the Capitals. We were team, teammates in Minnesota, and we were teammates in Toronto. <laughs> Unbelievable. And one, one thing, Garth, that, that what's amazing uh, when I think back at the time we played together was how many times did I give you the queen of spades when we were playing hearts <laughs> on the planes? <laughs> so we played so much cards in the back of the plane. And Mur we played hearts all the time. And, and Murph, Murph, I, I thought I was going for control so many times until Murph either gave me the queen of spades or he passed me a two of hearts. I'm not quite well, sure. Well, that, that's, I, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't, there was, you know, was four people playing. I didn't care if I won or not, but I just wanted to make sure that you did. Uh, you're the best, Murph. Truth comes out after all these years. Well, we should wrap this up, but, uh, just want to thank you guys uh, so much for for spending some some time here with us. Uh, we're we're absolutely grateful for the years you spent in, in Washington. You guys were in the ground floor and the foundation of of what we have here in Washington right now. And uh, I know the fans around here, uh, the ones who remember you definitely appreciate you, and the ones who don't should. Uh, so thanks for your 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 years of service here, and it's always great to see you guys. Uh, when we do run into you uh, on the road, and hopefully that'll be that'll be sometime soon. Um, but thanks, thanks, thanks for spending thanks, time Mike. with us today. Thanks to Erica Sandage for uh, setting this up. Uh, she works with our alumni, and thanks to Zach Garrett, who is fabulous at working uh, behind the scenes to set up the, the technical aspects of all of our 
uh, podcasts and cap social stuff. And thanks to everyone for hanging out with us and locker. Thanks, man. It's always thanks. good to see you. Definitely These miss two guys are better. the best folks. We know that. It yeah, we, yeah. Thanks, well, like, you said, Thanks, like you said earlier today, we could have done 10 hours of this and I absolutely would have, would have loved that. We could do a little 10 part series. Uh, you guys had such long, uh, and distinguished careers and, and yeah, I feel like we barely scratched the surface, but, uh, some, some great yarns and we definitely appreciate you guys' time. Thanks. Take care. Pleasure. Take care, guards. Thanks, Murph. Have a good one. See you, See you, you locker. Fellas.